Welcome to this session of the Plant Pure Summit 2016, co-sponsored by PlantPureFoods.com. Our guest is Stefan Esser, MD. Dr. Esser is a physician, author, and motivational speaker specializing in sports medicine and lifestyle modification. He's dedicated to empowering individuals to achieve their best health and maximum fitness, fun, and function. Prior to to his career in medicine, he was a competitive tennis player, achieving a ranking of number one in the U.S. Men's Open doubles in 2002. So welcome to the summit, Doc. Now, it's my pleasure to be here and share the passion with you all. That's great. Uh, So first of all, I want to, it's, you know, reaching number one in anything is really hard, especially in tennis. You know, I mean, that's, that's a big deal, I think. So, uh, it's a wonderful t- sport. It, it is a one of my dad played it avidly and he, he loved the sport. So, um, I came to love it just by watching. I had never played very much, but so tell us about the dedication it took for you to become so successful as a tennis player. Well, as all of you know, to kind of achieve anything that's worthwhile takes hard work. And as they say, if it's worthwhile, the hard work is worth it. And uh, that goes for all sports, our academic work, everything we do. Uh, You know, but for tennis, certainly a lot of hours on the court, uh, a lot of hours in the gym, a lot of hours working on all the the finer tuning points of movement and changing position and direction and ball handling and all the rest. So a lot went into it. It was a lot of fun and a special time in my life. That's uh, great. You know, I, I think a lot of people don't appreciate the or the strategy that's involved in doubles. For me, I, it's always great to watch a doubles match to see how the 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 p- people work together. Did you uh, did you basically have one partner your whole career, or did you switch partners a lot? Well, I was blessed to play with my cousin a great deal, who is uh, just a fantastic collaborator and communicator. And so, as you said, with doubles, it's about communication. So it's you're only uh, half of a team, right? So half the yeah. goes to the other person. Yeah, what I love to see is, you know, when, you, when the, the net person holds their hand behind their back and signals, you know? <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So that's really cool. So did your career as an athlete influence the way you practice medicine? Very powerfully. You know, I'm a physiatrist. I did my physical medicine and rehab training up at Harvard. And, you know, as a physiatrist, our goal is to maximize function, right? So whether that be helping someone to achieve just walking across the floor, walking up a flight of stairs pain-free, or whether it be an elite athlete trying to take a couple microseconds off their last pull in the swim. You know, so all of those are are part of our goal as a physiatric practice. And, you know, as a uh, former athlete myself and still somewhat of one, uh, I can appreciate the passion for athletics that people bring to the table and uh, their desire to perform at their their peak level. Uh, So when did you adopt a plant-based diet and why did you decide to do that? You know, my story is a little unique, I think, out there. My grandfather was Dr. William Esser, a naturopath and chiropractor, one of the leaders in plant-based nutrition back in the 1930s and 40s and moving ahead. And uh, so he actually ran a 10-acre health ranch of plant-based nutrition and gentle exercise for 65 years in South Florida. It's called Esther's Ranch. And so I grew up there. I grew up plant-based and uh, eating nothing but fruits, vegetables, and the like. And uh, just really from a young age, learned how amazing it was to thrive and to feel fantastic on a plant-based program. Uh, That's great. It must have helped you in your athletic career a lot, too, I imagine. Oh, hugely. You know, it's uh, far fewer injuries, more rapid recovery, uh, you know, all of the good stuff that an athlete wants. Did uh, what about your fellow athletes, uh, fellow tennis players? Uh, Did a lot of them know that you were a vegan? And if so, did they give you a hard time about it or anything? You know, the majority of people out there, um, you know, they're fearful or they're aggressive with things they don't understand. And when they begin to understand it, they open up far more to it. Isn't that how it all is with everything in our lives? And with sport and a plant-based program, it was very similar. Uh, You know, a lot of people would wonder, what are you eating for lunch? What's that? Or what are you having for dinner? But once they saw that we could run longer, push harder, you know, recover faster, as well as just how amazing the food tastes, uh, the overwhelming majority of people uh, adopted many of the things that we encouraged in them. Very cool. So you spread it amongst the tennis world, sort of. Sort of. That's always the goal. You know, and whether it be that, hey, 
some of the guys on the teams or on the groups that I played with just started eating a few more bananas, a little bit more of a salad. Uh, that was a win right there. So how does plant-based nutrition fit in with the practice of sports medicine? I think it goes hand in hand. You know, number one, as a physician, my goal is to help people be well and to be healthy. And truly, we know that health comes from healthy living. That's the heart of this, right? So I practice a little bit of a comprehensive approach to patients' care. If somebody comes to see me with knee pain and they're overweight or obese or have diabetes or heart disease, I don't just leave it at, well, let me just address your knee. I want to address the whole person because that knee bone, as the song says, is attached to the thigh bone, which is attached to the spine bone, and it's all one big person. And so plant-based nutrition allows the human body to perform at maximum. And it, for the longest period of time in our life, for decades on decades, you know, I always think of my grandfather, when I was ranked in the top 20 of the state in boys 12s, 14s, 16s, 18s in tennis, you know, he was 85 years old. And there I was about 14 or 16, and he could still beat me in tennis. And I was in the top, you know, 50 in the state. I mean, it's just amazing when you think about that, you know, as I look back. That is amazing. It must, it must have really pissed you off, too, though, in a, in a way. <laughs> Well, it made me proud of him and it made me work even harder. You know, it's uh, when the people you love and care about are really performing at a high level, it's a beautiful thing to see. That's cool. That's cool. So do you see a plant-based diet as being optimal even for professional athletes who need to maximize their strength and endurance? Great question. You know, I think it's so important to see athletes as what they are. They are people living within the world. And they are trying to achieve their very best in their chosen sport. However, we never want to get sidetracked of using certain diets or interventions that may help them perhaps in some way on the field, but harm them long term. And I think the first thing that I love about a plant-based program is we know it doesn't harm people long term. In fact, it advances their long term health globally and comprehensively throughout their body. That's a beautiful thing. Number two is we're seeing more and more evidence in literature that consuming more of these micronutrient-rich foods, the blues, the purples, the greens, when we talk about anthocyanopigments and beta-carotene and all these things, that it actually increases performance. It enhances blood flow to the tissues. It accelerates detoxification after hard workouts. I mean, it is just on so many levels, it enhances and improves improves performance. So we are seeing more and more athletes at elite levels. I mean, whether it be the NFL with folks like David Carter or Arian Foster, you know, whether it be tennis, like Novak Djokovic, right? Largely a plant-based program he's on right now. Whether it be Scott Jurek and ultra running, or, you know, um, Nick Diaz and, and Mac Danzig in cage fighting. I mean, there's so many elite level athletes out there that are recognizing the power of this to really fuel their bodies in a way that helps them perform again and again and again and recover, as I said, faster. Uh, I love the micronutrient studies. There's some great ones recently out there on stuff like, for example, tart cherry juice or on beet juice and things of that kind. We're just drinking a glass of these juices several days prior to performance allows people to go longer, let's say cyclists and runners, before they reach exhaustion. And in addition, they have less soreness a day or two after that whole DOMS we talk about, delayed onset muscle soreness. But they get less of that, which what does that mean? It means they can train harder, get back faster, and keep pushing longer. So, I mean, the studies are there and it's beautiful to see. And now the average Joe and the elite athlete are beginning to hear the message and incorporate it into their lives. Uh, what about the conventional wisdom among pe bodybuilders, for instance, who, you know, you, you, it used to be you'd see them, well, I got to eat 17 times a day and take in 9,000 calories, and it's all like tuna, you know, or something like that. There's, uh, so yeah, how, can you really bulk up with that plant-based diet? I'd say that, so the specific sports that really prioritize bulking, right? Whether that be the NFL defensive lineman, whether that be kind of the uh, Olympic lifter, right? These sort of very minute classes of athletes, but nevertheless, those group of athletes require, they do, they require very large quantities and large volumes and large calories to achieve 
that level of size. Now, you and I could debate, you know, whether or not that's really healthy for them long term, right? I take care of a bunch of NFL athletes, and I can tell you they're not in the best of shape, especially as they age, right? Their careers end very quickly. But for the average Joe, we should not be comparing ourselves, first of all, to an NFL defensive lineman. They have very different goals than we do. Their career burns out very early, right? Most of them are out certainly well before 40. And now they've got decades of time in which to unfortunately suffer often chronic illness, chronic injury, chronic pain due to what they've done to their bodies. So, uh, you know, for that express group, the Olympic uh, power lifters, let's say, and the NFL defensive linemen and such, they require more calories. They can get more than adequate calories and adequate protein from a purely plant-based program. It just has to be appropriately put together. Uh I, you're probably too young to remember this, but uh, there was a really a great uh, Russian uh, powerlifter, uh, uh, Alexeyev, I mm-hmm. think was his name, and uh, he, he was just gigantic. But you know, it, these these uh, super heavyweights in the powerlifting categories, they look fat. They don't, uh, you know, it's like, but cl- uh, clearly there's a lot of muscle there too. But he he died young. He died when he was like 56. You know. So I got to think that all those calories he was pushing in his mouth, pushing in his body, pushing through his body the whole time, and and probably the types of calories he was putting in. And we have to remember, again, that's getting back to my thesis there, that right now in America, the number one killer, and really in Western, kind of, if you will, the Western world, the number one killer is heart disease in men and heart disease in women, far and away. So any nutrient approach, any lifestyle that we pursue should take into account what we're most likely to die of. And so when we want to achieve performance in our sport, in our work, et cetera, make sure that we're not undermining our long-term health for those short-term goals. That's really important. And so remember too, two out of three Americans in a, right now are overweight or obese. One out of three has high blood pressure. One out of six has high cholesterol. One out of nine has diabetes. You know, so these diseases are real. And all of the studies, the NIH, the CDC, all these big research, the World Health Organization, everybody recognizes that more plants reduces the risks of those diseases. So we want to achieve our performance on the sport field, the court, wherever we are in the gym, but not undermine our long-term health, just like you said. And and many people think, well, I want to be big, so I'm going to eat lots and lots of animal flesh, lots of animal-based protein. And of course, that comes with all the saturated fat and all of the cholesterol and all of the other negative health sort of inputs that we don't want in our lives. It, it, It does seem to me, though, that people like that, there's a great deal of temptation to put short-term goals ahead of their long-term uh, uh, well-being, you know, because it's like, well, I got a chance to play in the NFL, you know? Yeah. And I think that's a legitimate point, right? And uh, that's the beauty of what we're seeing with these athletes, like, you know, the Arian Fosters, the David Carters in the NFL, et cetera, 300-pound guys, you know, that are plant-based and consuming that program, and yet performing at a really elite level. So it is doable. Not here as a sports doc to ever tell people to put their sports dreams aside. That's not it. I want to help them achieve that in a way that is the healthiest for them long term. Oh, well, that's great to hear. And I was going to ask ask you specifically, what are some of the professional athletes you know that are on a plant-based diet? Any more besides the ones you mentioned? Uh, There's such a litany right now. I always tell people, if you're curious, plug it in Google and you'll see this list after list, you know? And, And not only that, I think there are a lot of people that don't quote, self-identify as plant-based, but they're incorporating more and more and more of the fruits and vegetables, right? Whether that be like, if you look at the articles on Tom Brady and all yeah. these other, they're all eating more of the good stuff. And that's where we want to always be moving our athletes in that direction. Uh, and it, it seems to me that they may be shying away from the label of being called vegan. You know what I mean? They, they, they will like obfuscate just a little bit. You know, they may be plant based, but uh, or they're just saying, no, we're, I'm, I'm shifting my diet in this direction. OK, but vegan? No, I'm not a vegan. <laughs> right. Right. You know, it's almost like that. That word is a, a dirty word in professional sports or in a lot of places still in American society. Right. I, th- I think it is, you know, and so for me, my tendency because unfortunately, a lot of people, uh, you know, associate, quote, the word vegan with kind of living on a commune or something like that. 
and uh, you know, it certainly is not. Uh, but in order to, in some ways, my goal is to share the message with people. So if they already have a strong negative association or connotation with the word vegan, I'm going to talk about eating more plants. I'm going to talk a plant-based approach, right? Yeah. Uh, because that also though, sets people free. They don't feel like they're part of a religious organization that if they do eat a piece of meat at some random event, uh, they haven't violated a, a rule or a law necessarily. You know, so uh, yeah. Yeah, in the film I helped make, uh, uh, Forks Over Knives, we sort of made a decision at the beginning of that movie when we started it not to use the term vegan because especially at that time, and th this was in 2010, you know, I mean, uh, the V word had a lot of baggage attached to it, you know. Right. But well, an awesome movie you made that uh, has really transformed so many lives. So thanks for all your work with that. Well, uh, I got to give a lot of credit to a lot of other people who, who worked on that movie. I, I was just a part of it, uh, you know, uh, especially our producer, John Corey and uh, Brian Wendell, who was the it was his idea. And he he's the, the guy that financed it. So we could make the movie that we wanted without somebody having coming in and saying, no, you can't say that or. You know, you can't step on there. Some you you can't say that about the milk industry. Come on, <laughs> right? Yeah. So that was good. Uh, so you are currently a sport and spine physician uh, in Florida. What sort of patients do you see? I see everything, and it's it's such a pleasure to to have that opportunity. I see everything from eleven year old children to. Last week, I think a 94-year-old gentleman. Uh, I see people who are weekend warriors, people who just want to be able to walk up a flight of stairs without pain. And I see elite athletes who are playing at the world-class level. So I also take care of local colleges and high schools that I'm involved with. So it uh, really keeps me busy. It's a lot of fun. And, you know, kind of there's a universal theme that you begin to see when you see enough people. People want to be well. They want to be healthy. They want to be able to do things and have adventures and, and experience life, right? They all have slightly different goals, but they want this very similar things. And I think what's so beautiful about this plant-based model and this approach is it really helps so many people to achieve their best version of themselves. And the food in combination with movement, right? Exercise is medicine, if you will, it is so powerful. Those are the two big pillars for our health. Uh, I was giving a talk last night, you know, we just, I will never want people to forget how powerful their fingers, their feet, and their forks are, right? In their health care. That's, that's a great way to put it. Fingers, yeah. feet, and forks. That, that sounds like a good title for a, a book or a movie. That's it. Well, you know, and what I do, you know, here in clinic is I have the pleasure of doing everything from even uh, very age old things like acupuncture to the most uh, cutting edge science of uh, stem cell work that I also do. And all throughout that process is shared the message of plant-based nutrition uh, to help people facilitate their best outcomes. When you see, uh, let's say, younger athletes who are maybe uh, in high school or college, does your athletic background uh, come in handy? Does it make a difference in your credibility with them? I think I can appreciate and understand where they are, what it feels like to be working hard both in academics and athletics to achieve your best. I can appreciate the pressure that the young athletes and older athletes place on themselves to perform at a, at a high level and to achieve their best. And I can also understand, because I've had injuries along the way, what it feels like to be sidelined for a period of time. So I hope that that translates to my, uh, my patients and helps me to give them a better quality of care and uh, really to empathize with them. Because you know, when you're hurting, whether it be just a sports injury or some chronic injury, it's hard to hurt. You know? And you hate to see people suffer. And so I try to bring that to the table. And again, to get back to it, that's where the plant-based model is so beautiful. Because when I see people come in who might have knee pain or back pain or this, the other, uh, or even the young kids who struggle with their, their, their kind of aesthetics and have a bunch of acne, is you know, saying, well, you know, this, you can make some changes here that could powerfully influence these risks. And uh, helping people get off their diabetes medicines or their hypertension medicines, reduce weight, reduce inflammation at the cellular level. This is powerful stuff that influences a person's chronic pain 
as well as a person's performance, you know, out there on sports day. I saw a guy uh, yesterday, actually, a clinic who came back to me, you know, in the last about month and a half, two, three months, I forget, I think what it was, he's lost about 46 pounds, you know, and he was just like, doc, my back doesn't hurt anymore. My knees don't hurt anymore. He's like, that plant-based thing you told me to do, I've shared it with so many people. He's like, and then it was funny because this guy walked up to me at the talk the other last night. He said, hey, I saw one of your patients who you told to eat plants and he did it. It worked for him. So I tried. I'm already 15 pounds down. This is great. You know, and I said, well, that's fantastic. You know, keep it up. Uh, and, and the better you feel, the more active you want to be, right? Because now you're, you don't hurt as much. And, uh, you know, we have the most rapidly aging population. Yeah. And we also have the most obese population. So those two things go hand in hand. Um, it's interesting for me as a you know, former elite athlete, a lot of the guys I trained with and played with, uh, even in college and such, uh, you know, by the time they're in their 30s and 40s, all of a sudden, they've just fallen apart, right? And uh, that nutrition plays a huge part in that, right? It, even bigger than movement and exercise for many of them, uh, you know, so it's, uh, it's so intrinsic to all of us that we need to, we need to have more of that. You know? Yeah. So I take it that uh, uh, recommending a plant-based diet is a key part of your practice. Absolutely. You know, and I, I try to identify, and all of us should do this. If you're not familiar with Prochaska's stages of change, you should see where you are. And this is kind of a psychologist who came up with this model of assessing behavioral change. And it, you look in the mirror and you say, am I in pre-contemplation? I mean, I've never even thought of eating more plants. I've never even thought of starting movement. Or are you in contemplation? Are you thinking about it? Are you saying, you know what? I'm not as healthy as I want to be. I wonder what's out there. Or are you in preparation? Have you already kind of watched Forks Over Knives or Plant Pure? You know, or have you watched some good videos, bought some books, and you're saying, you know what? I'm ready. I'm ready to begin to prepare my life to make change. Uh, you know, are you in action phase already? Are you eating more plants? How can we take you to the next level? And so I talk to patients and I, I try to find out where they are. And if they're not ready, I throw down a few little comments here and there just saying, hey, whenever you're ready, let me know because there's some powerful stuff I can share with you. And then some people come into me and they just say, you know what? I'm so tired of these drugs. You know, when you stop and think about it, basic drugs like a beta blocker, right? Which is for high blood pressure, right? It makes you impotent, makes your hair fall out and gives you depression. That doesn't sound like a lot of fun to me. And, you know, versus, hey, let's eat lots of fruits and vegetables. And all of a sudden your sex life is improved. Your energy is better. Your overall just you, you feel better and you want to do more. Your depression levels go down, et cetera. And I mean, that's beautiful message to share. Some people are ready to embrace it. Other people, you know, they're still a little unsure or they haven't even thought about it. And I'm planting that seed of beginning to think. Yeah. You know, we need to each address ourselves, you know, because they're different parts of our lives, whether it be the, the stress component, sleep, whether it be inadequate exercise, you know, et cetera. We all can improve, you know, in our lives. And so we should think about where am I? Am I, am I ready to change or am I still holding on to those old habits that are keeping me down? Yes. Yeah, so the, I, I was going to ask, uh, how do your patients react in the main when you recommend a plant-based diet? What's, you know, the sort of spectrum of of responses you get. In the old days, I think I came with such a passion for it that it was a little overwhelming to quite a few people. And I'm trying to learn, and I think I have, on how to bring that message in a way that meets the individual where they are. And I think that anyone who's watching this right now who already has adopted a plant-based program for a while, you know how good you feel and how excited you are about it. You also have probably had that experience too, where you came out a little too strong to somebody and they're like, whoa, hold on there. And so everybody's response is a little different. I'll tell you, I'm learning. So for example, when I show the message, say, you know what? Are you tired of being on those medicines? Would you love to feel more energy? And they go, mm. you know, I'm trying everything. Nothing works for me. I go, hmm, all right, I'll bring it up at the next visit, right? Is what I'm thinking yeah. in my head. I'm not ready yet. Or I just give them a handout and say, go watch this movie. Go read this book. Tell me what you think when you come back. But the person who responds and says, yeah, I am tired of, you know, I just, I'm almost tired. I'm almost worn out. The doc says I need more medicines, you know, my primary care, whatever. Those are the people who are ready. And some people I'm amazed by because I, 
all I do is I share the message, I give my handout, I give them some information, some people grab it, hook, line, and sinker, and they come back to me. I had a guy the other day come back, we're gonna do some stem cells in his knees to regrow cartilage, and I said, we have gotta help you lose some weight, reduce inflammation in your body, I want you to try this plant-based program. He came back, he'd already lost 30 something pounds in about five weeks, he was feeling fantastic, and he's just like, I'm just gonna keep going on this. My knees feel better already, and I'm like, that's awesome. You know, just the inflammation being reduced. And for some people, it is transformative. And some of my athletes who come to see me with chronic cramping, right, in their limbs, chronic dehydration issues. You, you want to remember, when you consume a plant-based program with more calories from fruits and vegetables, you're going to get more water. You're going to get more micronutrients. You're going to get more magnesium and potassium, all of the things that the cells need to perform at a good level. And a lot of their cramping improves and all these other issues. So, you know, it's, uh, it's fun to see and it's fun to meet people where they are. It, it must make you feel great as a doctor when you see uh, such positive results. It's got to be great for you. You know, you know it's, it is so exciting. And I wish for the sake of all of my medical colleagues that more of them could experience it. You know, I had the joy and the pleasure of growing up my grandfather's ranch, right? It was really a land of miracles. So I saw everyone get well. Then I went to medical school. I went to, you know, residency at Harvard, fellowship at Mayo. And all we did was give people more drugs. And it was kind of like, there's something missing here, isn't there? You know, uh, either I grew up in the land of voodoo or we're not sharing the full message. And as I began to research the science, because remember, I grew up with the experience. It was an experiential life for me to feel well. And when I would eat less than ideal foods, I wouldn't feel as good. But when I went into medicine, I began to see all the science and the literature, study after study after study, validating this plant-based approach. And it's amazing because all of the national organizations, whether it be the NIH or the CDC, the American Heart Association, American Diabetes Association, they all say we should eat more fruits and vegetables, don't they? Yet down at the clinic level, kind of in the community, that message is often forgotten or missed. It's just kind of mixed up with all of this other stuff, whether it be this uh, paleo approach or, you know, high protein blank blank approach, but, you know, fill in the blank there. And yet there's no real science there. You know, in fact, I often show my athletes these, these big uh, studies that looked at, you know, the more protein we consume, the higher our rate of death, right? Increased mortality, increased rates of heart disease, diabetes, and all the rest. So it's, uh, the science is so compelling for a plant-based program. And even more exciting, of course, is how good you feel, right? Because most people care less about the science that you can feel doing it. As a physician, of course, I care about both. Um, and so when I see patients transform their lives and come back and see me and go, hey, guess what? I'm off this medicine now. And now I'm off this medicine. And now I'm able to do this more. And now da -da -da. it is so joyful to me, right? We give high fives. We give each other hugs. I mean, it's just, it is really, really cool. And, uh, you know, it makes being a physician fun again. And that's any physicians watching this, I want to tell you, it's time to integrate this into your practice because it is so much fun to see people well instead of just doling out medicines, you know? And medicine has its place. The interventions I do with injections, with stem cells, it's, I mean, these all have their place. But we've got to have in that pyramid, if you will, of of healthcare, the foundation needs to be a plant-based program with gentle, moderate exercise for everyone. So uh, what do your orthopedic colleagues uh, think about uh, your emphasis on plant-based nutrition? You know, I think initially, because uh, I work in a big, big practice, we've got 14 other guys here, et cetera. Initially, they were all a little unsure of what I was doing. And then they began to see some of my patients, you know, come back to see them or others. We share patients, of course. And they were like, hmm, okay, that looks pretty good. In addition, they've heard a little bit of my spiels, right? And my passion for this, as you would imagine. And, uh, you know, I've seen many of them say, hey, I'm gonna try to eat more fruits and vegetables. I'm gonna eat more of what Stefan is doing. You know, the majority of doctors are intelligent people. And if, you, they rec if you're giving them the science a little bit and then also share the message, uh, you know, they really embrace it uh, more heartily. And so actually every once in a while, I'll get a referral from one of my colleagues saying, hey, just do some lifestyle medicine with this person, right? Because I know they could use it. And they even will often text me, I know you're going to talk to them about blank, blank, blank. Uh, can you also talk about their knee? <laughs> so 
you know, um, it's uh, it's a joy to work with a group of uh, folks that are you know embracing it more and more. And I think across the country, we're seeing a movement, a movement like this, just like this this symposium, this summit. Uh, the movies that are coming out, the books that are coming out, more and more people are adopting this approach. As a result, physicians are hearing it more. As a result, physicians are becoming more open to it. And uh, it's very exciting. One of the things I did at the Institute of Lifestyle Medicine at Harvard when I worked with uh, the team up there was trying to share that message more and trying to get into the medical school curriculums, uh, programs about plant-based nutrition. So for example, I gave talks at Harvard Medical School and, and other medical schools around the nation. So um, you know, it's coming. The tide is shifting, which is very exciting. Uh, so how, how do plant foods uh, uh, specifically uh, reduce inflammation? Great question. I'd say there are probably three or four mechanisms. Some we don't even fully understand, but let's go with the science, as I said. Let's start with a simple one. Uh, probably the most powerful, uh, if you will, or basic, I should say, molecule of inflammation is something called prostaglandins. Prostaglandins are molecules that are, are the most basic form of inflammation in the body, whether it be from osteoarthritis or whether it be from a woman having her premenstrual cramps and then her period. Prostaglandins are the molecules that make one experience pain. Now, prostaglandins are a molecule that is formed from a parent molecule called arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid is converted to prostaglandins by an enzyme called COX, COX-1, COX-2. And these enzymes are actually inhibited by anti-inflammatories, ibuprofen, Motrin, Aleve, Naproxen, Bimovo. Those drugs inhibit this conversion. But what's fascinating, let's say the basic inflammation concept here, is that arachidonic acid is largely derived from meat and dairy. So you remove those foods that have arachidonic acid out of your diet, you have less parent molecule to form your prostaglandins, and you need fewer pain medicines. So they're at the most basic molecule form. Uh, we strip out some of the inflammation. Number two, studies out of Johns Hopkins show that plant-based foods cause blood vessels to dilate and open up more. This allows more blood with oxygen and nutrients to rush into areas of injury to thereby facilitate healing. On the opposite side of that spectrum, the same studies showed that you can reduce blood flow through the brachial artery by half for up to four hours by eating a single high fat, high cholesterol meal. So you can inhibit blood flow to areas of the body that need it. So put this into perspective. The sprinter goes out and sprints. They need good blood flow to their muscles and their legs so they can function. Boom, 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 again and again. Well, if they have just inhibited blood flow to their body by eating a high-fat, high-cholesterol-laden meal, they're not going to get nearly as good a performance. And that's what happens. So that's where those studies, for example, on the pomegranate juice, right, the tart cherry juice, the blueberries, the greens, et cetera, they dilate the blood vessels. They enhance blood flow to the tissues so the body gets more of the oxygen and the nutrients delivered to the tissues. I mean, imagine a highway. If it's backed up, you cannot get your merchandise, your produce, whatever, down the road, right, to where it's needed. Well, you want that highway to be wide open. And that is exactly what plant-based nutrition does for people. Then at the cellular level, it appears that oxidation associated with energy production, with mitochondria, which are little energy producers of the cell, is significantly altered by plant-based nutrition versus flesh or animal foods and you know, processed foods and all the rest. So uh, we know that the body functions more superiorly. You know, more efficiently, as well as I just mentioned, in more improved blood flow to the tissues and less prostaglandin formation. There are so many other ways that are being discovered year after year. But these are some of the basic models out there. Uh, well, so the conventional wisdom is that consuming large amounts of dairy uh, products is critical for developing strong bones. What's yeah. your take on that? You know, the first question I always ask people when they bring that, uh, you know, myth up is, do you know any other animal on earth that drinks the milk of another animal voluntarily? Once the crickets have stopped making noise, then I say, yeah, so why are, why, why are we even talking about this, right? Do you think we're so randomly made or bizarrely evolved or whatever that somehow we have a need, but no other creature on earth does? 
It doesn't even make any sense that we have a physiologic innate need for the milk of another creature. And so this, this is a fallacy. And if you look at the, the biggest studies that exist out there, the reviews, et cetera, it, it doesn't hold water, if you will, in the medical literature. That's the first thing, you know, or the second thing to me. Uh, you know, and even in the models and the studies you look at that relate rates of osteoporosis to milk consumption and calcium balance, women who consume, right, a, a standard American diet with lots of dairy included end up a negative calcium balance. I mean, the studies that are out there showing the rates of osteoporosis being the highest in the countries that consume the most meat and dairy, it's just study after study. I mean, after a while, it's almost like it's, you see all this science, you have to say, look, it's there, it's real. And, you know, for people, we need to remember that osteoporosis, right, which is the thinning out of our bones over time, because it's real, right? Women, after the age of 35, lose about 1% of bone mineral density per year. Yeah? When they go into menopause, 2 to 3% bone mineral density for about 5 to 10 years, and then it goes back to 1% loss. And men lose a little slower because of the test effects of testosterone. Well, well, nevertheless, those bone mineral density losses are not due purely to inadequate or lack of calcium. That's not the issue there. In fact, in studies done on Buddhist nuns, which is great, who are strictly vegan and comparing them to average women of the same age, the, you know, at same activity levels, et cetera, in that same nation, there was no significant difference. Even though the purely vegan women consumed less calcium, they had no higher rates of fractures and no higher rates of osteoporosis. So these studies have all been done. We want to remember that healthy bones is not one single element, right? It includes lots of elements, your magnesium, your boron, your vitamin D, your calcium, your total calorie intake, all the alkaline foods, as well as exercise, right? So resistance training for the bones, that if you look at studies, resistance training can inhibit loss. It can slow loss by as much as 1% per year. So, I mean, it's almost matching the negative effects that occur over time. And this is where we need to remember not to put ourselves on the shelf. We've got to stay active. We've got to stay strong uh, as, you know, as we age. And so putting together a whole program of you know, bone health, uh, that's what's key you know, for a lot of folks, anyone who's concerned. It's not, it's not the dairy, as cute as those little mustaches are on people, it's not about that white mustache that actually gives people healthy bones. And uh, you know, that we won't even go into obviously all the other issues with milk, whether it be the autoimmune effects on the body, whether it be casein and its stimulation of growth, whether it be insulin-like growth factor one, and it's stimulant of growth, if you will, at the cellular level in a negative way for many. And so those are all areas that each of you should do your research on as you're thinking about, sorry, drinking more cow pus, right? Not the best choice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, this reminds me of something that uh, Dr. Esselstyn uh, said in the movie and other places too, that, uh, uh, actually eating more animal food or consuming more dairy creates an acidic balance in our, in our bodies. And to, uh, to bring that into uh, equilibrium, the best buffer for uh, the body is calcium. So it actually withdraws calcium from our bones in order to reduce that ac acidic uh, condition. Have you heard that as well? Uh, well, and that, you know, that was one of the models that I was always raised with and makes a lot of sense. I think some of the newer literature questions that model actually a little bit. And so always want to stay up for me, you know, on top of that literature and say, okay, well, does that make sense anymore or not? The beauty is even if that one little principle or concept that was, uh, you know, that we often, you know, spoke of uh, doesn't necessarily bear out in the science, all that other scientific literature is there supporting the fact that consumption of dairy is not ideal. And also there are other factors. I mean, if you look at studies on sodium consumption, so the more sodium we consume actually and elevated quantities of caffeine and others, it strips out calcium from our bones. So these other, if you will, not true food products, right, uh, really have a negative effect on the body across, across the board and especially on bone health. Uh, so tell me a little bit about uh, ESSER health seminars. What do you teach and how do you do it? Esser Health is one of uh, my wife's and my uh, real joys. It's our baby. And what we do right now is we offer a plethora of different interventions, whether they be 
uh, lifestyle seminars that are some of them two hours long, some of them six hours long with nutritionists, psychologists, chefs, uh, exercise specialists, et cetera, all involved, in which we talk about the reversal of heart disease, diabetes, obesity, the, the enhancement of life, function, and performance. We do some for athletes. We do some for average Joes. Uh, we work with those wanting to uh, reverse chronic disease. We also rent out every once in a while a mansion on the beach here in uh, northeast Florida, and uh, people come stay for a seven to 10-day program. And uh, right now, we're working on hopefully getting Esther's Ranch, very similar to my grandfather, a, a lifestyle facility where people would come and stay for weeks to months if desired. We're working on getting that back up and running hopefully by 2017 or 18. So we've got a lot on the works. Uh, that's very cool. And it, those are great uh, aspirations to have. Uh, do you have any notable success stories about patients of yours that you'd like to share? You know, I, every patient who adopts a plant-based program has radical success, even if it's short term and they choose not to continue on the program because their social settings, their cultural habits, their own addictive personality pulls them back. And what we're always here to do is support them through that process and to bring them back, to encourage, to motivate, to empower, and to educate them as they go through the process. Because sometimes it's intimidating to make big changes in our lives, and it can feel overwhelming to make changes. But I'm here to tell you that those changes are so powerful. You know, every patient that I think of, who has adopted a plant-based program, has enhanced vitality, has improved performance, has increased their overall health. And every one of them has reduced the drugs they need, et cetera. And it seems radical to suggest that something can help 100% of people. But I tell you, it does. It helps 100% of people in some way, whether it helps them 100% totally with their problem or whether it's 80, 90, 30, 20. But the beauty of the model is that if appropriately designed, and if it's the appropriate condition, because let's face it, plant-based nutrition and exercise are not a panacea for everything, right? So I just think that's very important to put out there. If I have a fractured arm and my bone's sticking through the skin, don't give me green juice, right? <laughs> no, suture me up and put me back together, and then give me green juice so I can heal, right? Uh, so, so important that we're on the same page. In the same way, a person with severe metastatic cancer to every part of their body, you know, we may not be helping them a lot. We may help their quality of life a little bit at the end or reduce their pain a bit, but it may not change their outcome. But where the low-hanging fruit for this stuff is, is what most of us struggle with, right? Which is being overweight, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, heart disease, and pain knee arthritis, hip arthritis, uh, various things of that kind, various ailments of that kind, gastrointestinal complaints and the rest. That's where this shines and outperforms every medicine that we've ever had. And so if you look, for example, at the EPIC trial right now, where if you are eating more fruits, vegetables, simple foods, exercising, not smoking and the rest, you know, you end up reducing your risk of a chronic treatable disease by almost 90 something percent. You know, and this is beautiful. This is what we want for people. And so, you know, a good example, I think I shared several of them as we went through uh, our conversation today, uh, but uh, never underestimate is what I tell the viewers today. Don't underestimate what your body can do and how good you can feel because it's easy to get depressed with when you're struggling with sickness and, and illness or with just being on all those different medicines that you may be on right now. And you've tried a lot of diets, you've tried a lot of different interventions and nothing's worked for you. You've kind of been yo-yoing up and down your whole life for the last 20, 30 years. And I'm here to tell you today that that can stop. You can achieve the health you want. You can experience that vitality. My grandfather used to say, and I quote him now, you know, is you can rediscover what that once felt like when you were a little kid and you popped out of bed fresh and alive and energetic. And you can have that, whether you're in your 40s or your 70s or 80s. It, you can rediscover what it feels like to be healthy and to be human and to really achieve your best performance in every level. Wow, that's uh, really well said. Uh, since you've been practicing medicine, how far has this idea of using plant-based nutrition as a treatment for patients come with MDs? I believe that from a global perspective, we've made great strides. From a regional perspective, there's so much work still to be done. 
And that's the work that I'm trying to participate in. I actually am a, on the sports medicine faculty at Mayo Clinic now and work with a fellow and, and I am on the res, work with the residency, one of the local um, residency organizations for me medical residents and family medicine. And so trying to share and preach that message. And uh, we just come so far in, the, in this movement of plant-based nutrition and uh, more and more people are adopting and incorporating and sharing the message. And uh, there's a lot of work still to be done. And because there's still, you will have to remember, uh, I don't blame physicians. I just recognize the situation. And that is that in medical school, out of four years of education, we receive about two to four hours of education in nutrition. It's very sad. And that education in nutrition is all about vitamin deficiencies and bizarre things like scurvy and beriberi and, you know, and quashi oricord, things, diseases you see in sub-Saharan Africa. And we don't learn about the amazing studies of Dean Ornish or Caldwell Esselstyn or Walter Kempner or the rest who have shown in gorgeous, well put together studies in the Journal of American Medical Association, the New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, Circulation, all the rest, that these plant-based approaches powerfully alter disease risk for patients. And, you know, as patients, those of you out there listening to this who are patients, you need to go onto something like scholar.google.com and put in plant-based nutrition and heart disease, plant-based nutrition this, you know, vegan and this, vegetarian and this. And if you find studies and articles, print them out and bring them to your doctors and share them with them, right? So that you can be part of their educational process so that you actually can change hearts and minds because I have a certain circle of influence and then it stops. Each of you who are watching this have your own circles of influence. So if you take this message of, of joy and of health and of vitality, and you share it with all of your circles, think about how powerful that can be. Yeah, yeah I would really, it's like a snowball, man, going downhill, you know. Uh, it seems to me like it's just uh, really taking off, uh, and uh, that's very heartening, i got to say. So, uh, and people like you are clearly a huge part of this, so I thank you for taking the time to come on, and it's been an unbelievable pleasure talking with you. It's my pleasure and good luck to all of you out there watching. You guys can do this, commit to it, keep getting more education, enjoy the rest of the summit and just go out there and thrive. Uh, last thing, does, uh, do you have a, a website where people can go to uh, learn more about you and what you do? Sure, it is esserhealth.com, E-S-S-E-R health.com. Well, thanks for watching, everyone, and we encourage you to learn more about our efforts to build a Plant Pure Nation at our website, plantpurenation.com. Thanks again, doctor. My pleasure.